The setting sun was hiding behind the horizon, shining its rays on the crowns of the trees that surrounded the village in a semicircle. In this old village, it immediately went dark, as if someone invisible had flicked the switch. Only it wasn't quiet. Every now and then a yard dog would bark somewhere. Far away, in the forest strip, hungry wolves could howl. The locusts sang their songs as if they were playing little violins. At this hour, Grandpa Ion was listening for other sounds. The weeping of trees, the whisper of leaves in their crowns, the snap of branches under his feet. He hurried home, complaining that he had wandered too far and wouldn't get home before daylight. Though the man loved the forest and was not afraid of it. He worked as a gamekeeper, and after he retired, he used to go hunting in the local woods. Once, it happened, he even got lost. For two weeks he wandered through bushes and ravines, but he survived, because he was stubborn. Grandpa Ion usually had good luck with trophies. It helped that, although his eyes were already old, they saw much more than those of the townsfolk. He'd notice a broken branch on someone's paw, a mark on the bark of a tooth, or paw prints on moss. Today, the old hunter came across a fox track. He was so carried away that he didn't notice the darkness around him. It got dark in the forest much earlier than in the village. Grandfather John found the fox's den, however, and tracked it down, but did not try to get the beast out. He realized that the mother and her cubs were there. He felt sorry for the beautiful redhead, so he spared her. Oh you beast! Grandpa waved his fist in front of the foxhole. Don't get in my way. You won't get away a second time, understand? Take care of the children. Sighing, Grandpa John, without having eaten enough, walked back to his native village. He had wandered for a long time in the woods, he was cold and tired. He had been so absorbed in hunting that he had forgotten to eat. There you go, he spat sideways, talking to himself. And people still don't believe in superstition. Here I was walking towards the forest and I met Simon, a bald devil, with an empty cart. I said to him, don't go naked in front of me, it's bad luck. I'll run out of prey. And he laughed, saying that I am an ancient man, if I still believe in superstitions. And why shouldn't I? How could our ancestors be worse than us if they believed in such things? And if they had a full, loaded wagon, I'd be lucky. And the spoils. But no. The old man kicked a branch, still grumbling. Well, I'm going back to my cabin, I'll tell you all about it, Simon. You'll ask me for more dried meat. Look at him, he makes me old and dark. His nephew bought him a cool phone and he's very proud. He's learned to send e-messages. And he's quickly turned into a city boy. Tfu on you. The old man cursed his friend all the way, wanting to at least blame someone for his kindness of heart and, as a result, his failure at hunting. Ion decided to check one last time the traps he had set at the entrance to the forest. He didn't expect to see anything there, but it turned out that the prey had fallen into the trap. But it was a very strange one. Ouch, that hurt. Shoot already, Alex. What the hell, shouted the young man, interrupting his wailing from time to time to swear selectively. Get it off me, you idiot. Well, I'm pulling it. Shit, I don't know how to take it off. I wouldn't want to rip it off your leg. The colleague was wriggling around his friend. Does it hurt? No, it tickles. There's a trap on my leg. What do you think, is it painful or is it nice? The other one roared. Grandpa Ion threw his rifle and backpack on the ground and rushed to the young men, holy fathers. He shouted, throwing himself on his knees in front of the trapped boy. How did you do it? Can't you see where you're going? He quickly and deftly released the boy's leg. He immediately took off his tights to check that all his toes were still in place. When he noticed that the limbs seemed intact, he felt relieved. Well, what's there, Weldon? Everything seems to be normal. Alex leaned over his friend. Weldon looked at him unhappily, showing that, normal wasn't the right word. You're still lucky, said Grandpa John. What do you mean lucky? The boy whimpered, nursing his leg. That's right, silly, you've fallen into an easy trap. It's my trap for small animals. There's only rabbits around here. So you'll escape with a bruise and a scratch. And if you stood on the big game, your leg would break, said Grandpa John authoritatively. And why the hell did you come here? This is a hunting ground. Everybody knows that. For mushrooms and berries, that's on the other side, on the left side of the river. We're not from here, how should we know that, growled the victim angrily. Well, there hangs a sign. Scratching his gray beard, Grandpa noticed. Have you learned to read, strangers? Ion kept glancing at the young dark-haired man, 
who was looking at his companion with concern. At one point, Alex suddenly turned to the old man, good. The problem is over. Anyway, thank you very much, said Alex and held out his hand to shake Ions. If it wasn't for you, we would have had to spend the night in the forest. Or I would have dragged him after me myself with the noose. And here we don't know how far we have to go to this village. We've been circling for an hour and can't find our way. Is it magic, or what? Alex nodded behind the old man, pointing in the direction the travelers were heading. Grandpa John turned, looked into the woods, then stared at the boys fearfully, where are you going, my dears? There's only forest there. You'll run for a week, you'll beat your pace, you won't meet a living soul. Except a wolf or a bear. Weldon, hearing the old man's words, snorted in displeasure. Still angry that he had fallen into the trap, he looked sullenly at his companion. I told you I took the wrong road. And you say we're going by the map. We're going to have an adventure. We'll remember it in our old age. Here's an adventure. With you, Alex, I won't live to old age. Alex waved, urging his friend to be quiet, then pulled out a map. As it was completely dark around him, he lit the map with a flashlight. Here, we have to go this way. Can you tell us the way? The old man squinted, leaned closer to the paper, then laughed. Who took you for fools, my pigeons? The map is old, ancient. There's been nothing here for a long time. And here they built a bridge, he shook his head. And you go to the village of Purple Muscle. I'm from there myself, I've spent all my life in this place. I'll take you, you wretched travelers. My name is John, you can call me Grandpa John. Weldon was full of gratitude and shook the old hunter's hand again. Alex nodded to the old man, turning anger into pity. The young men realized they were exhausted. Alex helped Weldon to his feet and let him lean on his shoulder. The lame friend, using his comrade as a crutch, followed Grandpa John. Looking at their condition, the old man winked, Long have you been lost? And why have you come to our village? Are you looking for your relatives? No, we don't have anyone there. We were hoping to ask the locals for a night's accommodation. At least in a barn, admitted Alex. We are just travelers, you might say. How interesting, growled Grandpa, leading the travelers. Tell us, Grandpa John, called Weldon, who had already come to his senses. Why is your village called Purple Muscle? It's creepy, to be honest, that name. The old man smiled slyly, turned over his shoulder. There are two stories about that. Which do you want, the boring one or the interesting one? Let's find out both, Alex said laughing. Grandfather nodded and, stretching out the branches to let the youngsters go ahead, told, the first story is the following. It grows in our forests, in the marshes, the red mustard. And not only there, in fact. And in the cemetery, sometimes in the shade of the forest. It's also called brown moss. It's very valuable. In the old days, this moss was highly prized and used as a building material. As they assembled houses from logs or baths, this was used as insulation. Moss was also used as medicine. It was put on open wounds, it worked as an antiseptic, antiseptic. Weldon corrected his grandfather. Ion shook his head, that's what I said. Antiseptic. That is, it killed infections and contagions of all kinds. They say it was even infused and drunk to prevent stomach aches. And because of the abundance of this moss, they called the village the purple muscle. The end. What kind of story is this? The interesting one or the boring one? Weldon didn't understand. It's a true one. And there's another one that our grandparents and grandmothers fed us, and that scared us. They say that once upon a time, a red-haired girl lived in the village. A beauty, such as the world has never seen. Her skin was white as snow. Her hair wasn't just red, but scarlet, scarlet. The boys just looked at her. The other girls in the village envied her beauty. They spread rumors that she was a witch. People started gossiping about her, avoiding her. But the boys looked at her anyway. And one day, a young man fell so much in love that he lost his mind. He abandoned his fiancée, thinking of the beautiful redhead. So it was then said that she bewitched the young man, charmed him. The bride was so jealous and envious that she and her friends took the maiden away into the forest, luring her by deception. And there they killed the rival. It was winter. And there, where her red blood spilled on the white snow, the moss grew. Every winter since then, this moss has sprung from the earth and snow. It's as if the earth is crying with her blood. It still exists to this day. But there was something else. As soon as the maiden disappeared, the misfortune in the village began. All the crops in the village disappeared. 
No sooner had the seedlings appeared than the cold, hail or frost began, and sometimes red moss would appear in the fields. Our ancestors called the village purple mussel, to soothe the soul of the lost maiden and to ask for forgiveness. Wow, whistled Alex. That's right. Satisfied that he had managed to tell an interesting story, Grandpa smiled. When they reached the village, Grandpa looked around and waved, you know what, hawks? Let's go to my place for the night. My dinner is not much, but we'll have a roof over our heads. And I'll give you a bath, for you're as dirty as piglets. The friends looked at each other, happy to have found a place to sleep so quickly. The host welcomed them warmly. He was an old-fashioned man and knew how to make guests feel welcome. The only bad thing was that they were out of drinks and the new one wasn't ready yet, you know what? You guys go to the bathroom, and I'll go get my neighbor. That bald guy. I'll scold him for not believing in fortune-telling and ask him for a bottle. He always has it on him. He's hiding it from his wife, the old man began to fuss. Leaving his guests, he hurried to his neighbor's house. He entered the hut, as was the local custom, without knocking on the door. He found the owners at the table. Simon. He called out to his friend, a bald, elderly man. Come here, I have a word with you. Simon, a heavy man like a pig, got up from the table. Why are you shouting? He smiled. Oh, John is here. Mary, his wife, was happy. Sit down at the table with us. Today we have potatoes with lard. No Mary, I don't have time. I'd like a bottle of brandy. Because I have guests in the house and I don't even have a drop. I'm ashamed. The old man with the red face laughed. Guests. Simon wondered, rubbing his bald head. What kind of guests? You said that your relatives are no longer in this world. And you still want to rub salt in the wound, the old man muttered. They are not my relatives. They're just travelers. I discovered them in the forest, instead of rabbits I caught them. If it wasn't for me, they'd be lost in the woods, for God's sake. Simon grew strangely pale, frowned even more. Mary screamed, putting her fingers to her mouth. Husband and wife looked at each other. Why are you so strange? Frowned John. It's such a thing, Joan, said Simon. They said on the news that some prisoners were seen escaping near our village. They were walking in the woods. But what if you found them? Maybe we should turn them in? Mary suggested. Ion furrowed his gray, bushy eyebrows, thought for a moment, but then shook his head. What do you mean? I gave the boys shelter, I promised them dinner and lodging. And now I'm going to suspect them of something? No, they're not hooligans. They're just ordinary kids. One of them, Alex, looks like my James. When he left the village and never came back, at the memory of his nephew, the man's throat convulsed, but he recovered and continued, and they're weak, to be honest. One of them is lame now. What can they do to me? I look decrepit, but I have a lot of strength in my hands, you know that. Do you remember how I faced that wolf? With my bare hands. The one who used to break into our barns. Simon, still sullen, shook his head, that's true, but God protects the careful one, you know. I know one thing, if you've asked someone for help, be kind enough to offer it, Ion stubbornly said. So, will you give me a bottle, or shall I run to Posey? We'll give it to you, Simon waved his hand. But be careful, okay? Take the gun next to the bed. And call me if you need anything, driven by gloomy thoughts, Ion went back into the house. But his doubts disappeared as soon as he saw his guests. Both boys were dressed in the clean clothes their grandfather had given them. They were smiling, sitting modestly on the bench, like two sparrows that have just bathed in a puddle. I keep thinking about James, looking at Alex. He has black hair, with the same mustache. And he smiles so much alike. They can't be bad, they can't be, the old man thought. They sat down at the table and drank the bottle to the bottom. Ion hadn't felt so well in a long time, as he had in the company of travelers. They listened with pleasure to the old hunter's stories. It was time for bed. The old man marked out the best rooms for the guests. He himself lay down in the farthest room. The strength had taken its toll, and the walk through the woods made the old man feel sleepy. He fell asleep as soon as his head touched the down comforter. But something woke the old man in the middle of the night. He rolled over, but realized he was thirsty, he couldn't anymore. He wouldn't be able to fall asleep if he didn't drink water. Oh. Well, my hawks sleep in a deep sleep, he murmured, rising from the bed. Maybe I won't wake them. He wanted to walk past the boys and into the kitchen. The old man crawled in slowly, 
afraid to disturb the guest's sleep with a useless creak of a plank. Only it turned out they weren't sleeping at all. What are you going to do next? I'm tired of running, to be honest, through these woods and plains. Ion froze when he heard Weldon's voice. Alex, turning over on the bed and creaking the springs, sighed, Well, excuse me, that's how it's received. I didn't promise you a cruise with stops in five-star hotels, Alex replied sarcastically, Listen, maybe we'll bury him in any grave in the cemetery? In the local ground only, suggested Weldon. Here Grandpa John turned pale. He remembered Simon's warnings. That he might even let the fugitive murderers into his house. Grandfather grabbed the cross around his neck. He was so frightened, he listened to the rest of his friend's speeches. Who do they want to bury in the cemetery? Not me? He sighed in his mind. The man recoiled, not knowing what to do. And then, in the dark, he came across a bucket. The old man dropped it on the floor. There was a bang in the house. Guests sprang from the room, staring at the master of the house. Grandpa John crawled away from them, don't come any closer. He warned, trying to remember where he had left the gun. Don't come any closer, or I'll... I'll make you. Hey, you. Me with all my heart. And you. Grandpa, what's the matter with you? Have you had too much to drink? I heard your whispers. You conspirators, muttered the old man. He didn't find a gun, but he did notice a poker. The old man armed himself with it and jumped to his feet. Will you take me to the cemetery? You've got the wrong man. It's too early for me to go to the cemetery, he shouted, waving his gun. Alex and Weldon looked at each other and, burst out laughing. Alex looked with great tenderness at his frightened grandfather, Grandpa John, he said warmly. You've got it all wrong. We really have to get to the local cemetery. But we don't know which grave to look for. And we promised to bury my father there. I mean his ashes. In front of the stunned old man, Alex reached into his bag and pulled out a funerary urn. That's what he told me before he died. Let's go to the purple muscle, to bury him next to his father. Only we don't know his name. My father couldn't tell me that. What do you mean, frowned Grandpa, still having little faith in Alex's story. The young man ruffled his dark hair and shrugged his shoulders. When he was alive, he kept calling him Dad, and only Dad. He recounted how he, as a child, lost his parents. He was placed in a foster home, but there they abused him horribly. They beat him, forced him to work until he was exhausted, starved him. Then he decided to run away, only to finally get lost in the woods, Alex said. A forester found him then. He took him in. He became his father. When my father grew up, he left the village. First he spent two years in the army, then he studied at the Naval Institute. He first visited his father, wanted to take him with him, but he was stubborn. He liked village life. Then he kept sending letters to his father, but one day he didn't get any replies. He was worried, he wanted to go back to see how the old man was doing, but he got the news that he had died. He went into the woods and never came back. They even said they found his remains and buried them. And that's when he had to go on a journey. When he came back, he found out that his fiancée, my mother, was pregnant. They got married and waited for me to give birth. Only my mother died in childbirth. A doctor's error. Anyway, he raised me as best he could. Alex sighed heavily and sat down in a chair. He fixed his gaze on his hands, then clenched them into fists, continuing the story. I lived like that for twenty years with him, then my father got very ill. He was a sailor, brought on some kind of terrible illness. Before he died, he was often delirious. He used to say that he saw his mother, that she told him to go back home, to the village of Purple Muscle. So he asked me to bring him back to his homeland after he died. I gave my word. We just don't know which grave to look for. I tried to at least ask my grandfather's name. We have different last names, most likely. My father had a different surname, his adoptive father's. But my father, towards the end of his life, got very sick. He rarely recognized me. He'd mumble something, not answer me. That's how he died. But we had to grant his wish, we couldn't do otherwise. So I came here with my friend, the young man nodded to the silent Weldon, who was looking suspiciously at the old man's poker. We thought we'd ask the locals in the morning, or the cemetery workers, if there were any. Perhaps someone has heard such a story. We wanted to ask you too, but we got tired and got confused. We couldn't turn our tongues away. And how? What was your father's name? Grandpa asked in a muffled voice. The boy glowed. That smile was just like his son's. James. James Grove, he answered. 
Grandpa John's hands were shaking. The cowbell fell. He could barely stand up. The man's eyes filled with tears. Alex's face, stunned and frightened by the old man's reaction, floated before his grandfather's gaze. It can't be like that, he whispered, trying to wipe the tears from his frozen face. It can't be. Could it be my James? My son, my foundling? And I thought he was long dead. How can such a thing be? Alex and Weldon were completely confused. Grandfather jumped up and ran to the chest, ouch. He was moaning, digging through the contents of the chest like a mole. Ah, there he is. He took out an old photo album. With trembling hands, he opened it and beckoned to his guests. The young men bent curiously over the tattered pages, here it is. My James, Grandpa John stuck his trembling finger into the photo. Weldon whistled, and Alex winced, that's my father. He admitted. I mean, you. It's assumed that you. But my father thought you were already dead. He said one of the neighbors had sent him a message. He was told you'd gone to the woods, but never came back. Since then he doesn't like this land, because his father took it. Grandfather shook his head, wiping away his tears again. It was like that, it was. I went hunting and got into trouble. I hurt my leg, I got lost in the swamps, but I escaped in the end. I know the woods well, but back then it was like the devil was circling me. Two weeks later I returned to the village. I'm a tenacious man, explained the old man. And in the village, by then, they had already buried me. You won't believe it, but they found someone's remains and buried me. Fuck them, the bastards. It turned out later he was a lost traveler. The wolves had killed him. The old man clapped his hand on the album in frustration, then continued. When I came out of the woods, dazed, dirty, like a lion, Tammy saw me. Our young milkmaid. So she threw down the buckets and shouted, here comes the dead. She shouted all over the neighborhood, got everyone on their feet. But I didn't know, I didn't realize that my son was told about it too. My James. At first I thought he'd left me, that he'd completely forgotten me. Then Tammy confessed that she had written to James herself. She loved him, so she was looking for a reason to write him a line, John explained. Then I heard by ear that his ship was at sea, but got into a mess. The name of the ship was, Irresistible, and all the TV stations were talking about that disaster. At that time, Simon and I were staying at his house, I didn't have a TV. I didn't miss any news, I was waiting to hear about my son. And they did. I saw my son's name on the missing persons list. Alex almost jumped with emotion, yes, my father told me. The whole crew was caught in a storm. I was only three years old. I was living with my mother's parents, with my grandparents, while my father was traveling. They thought he was dead. But he came back. Grandpa shook his head, not believing what he had heard, of course he came back. He's as resilient as his father. My little son, my darling. He stroked the face of the young man in the photograph. In the picture, James was in a military uniform, because he had returned from the army. Next to him stood Ion, proud of his son. Tears rolled down the old man's face, curling in his beard. He twitched his nose, how so? How much time have we lost because of such ridiculous misunderstandings, he muttered. In Ion's heart there was both joy and sorrow. He was happy to know that his son had not been lost at sea. That he had loved and raised his son but it was painful and hurtful to know that they could still have said so much to each other, given each other so many warm hugs, but it was not to be. But he could have met his daughter-in-law and held his grandchild in his arms, I have a photo too. I took it just in case, to show it to the locals, Alex said, then headed for his backpack again. He took out a notebook, and from it he took out a wedding photo, here, he handed the photo book to his grandfather. Dad liked to joke that there were three of us in the photo. Only I couldn't see myself. Grandpa John took the photo carefully, as if it might fall apart. He smiled, noticing how happy James was. How tenderly he embraced his young pregnant wife. And the girl was so unusual. Her hair was bright red, almost red. Her skin was as white as snow. She looks like the girl in your story, doesn't she? Alex smiled, looking at his mother. That's what I thought at first, but I didn't say it. But what if you hadn't let us go home then? Only now did the old man realize that there were more than just guests in front of him. In front of him was his own grandson. Only then did the shock of Alex's story pass, leaving a bright spark of joy. Alex. So it's you. So we are, the old man moaned, looking at the young man in amazement. Alex stepped from one foot to the other, obviously embarrassed. 
James did the same thing when he was worried or troubled. Yes, it seems so. I'm your nephew, probably. Well, not yours, of course, so you mustn't think of me as someone. Looking at the floor, the young man muttered. The old man stopped listening. He stood up and hugged the boy to his chest. And his chest was torn with emotion. Alex, my dear, he whispered. Of course, you are my darling. How else? Thank you. Thank you to my son and your mother for giving me the chance to see you. Alex also hugged the old man with a shy smile. Then he hugged him tighter. He inhaled his grandfather's scent. The hunter smelled of wood and moss, and a bit of fire. The smell was pleasant, native. A cry echoed through the room. Alex and Grandpa John looked at Weldon in surprise. His eyes were red, moist. He waved, don't mind me, the boy was embarrassed. It's just. It's a miracle, really. It's like being on the show wait for me. How can you not cry? But I'm usually a tough guy. Alex smiled, looking at his friend, who was nervous. Grandpa John looked at his grandson again, not believing his happiness. James's ashes were buried in the village, purple muscle, just as he had wished. Coincidence or not, the same lovely moss appeared on his grave in winter. Alex, from that moment on, often visited his grandfather. Ion understood that, thanks to his encounter with his grandson, he had gained strength. He now knew he could live to be a hundred years old, or more. Finally, Grandpa John, although he didn't see his son's wedding and the birth of his grandson, did attend Alex's wedding party. Later, he held little Anne, his first daughter. And Alex also gave his grandfather a good smartphone, much to the envy of the neighbors. He also taught him how to use SMECs and even how to send photos. Did Grandpa John believe in the hunting superstitions of that time? Who knows? In the end, that hunt, which brought him no prey, turned out to be the best hunt of his life. So in vain he scolded Simon then. Let him drive his empty wagon. Here's such a touching story you heard today dear ones, and if you like this one, please very much support me with a like and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the new stories. Have a superb evening and a peaceful night everyone. We'll be back soon. Bye.